Jeremy Corbyn came to the Houses of Parliament for his first PMQs in the front of the establishment on both sides of the House. He said he was going to do things differently. He said that people told him that above all they wanted their voices to be heard in Parliament. He'd received 40,000 emails replying to his request for people's questions. The smug faces, those in the benches behind him and those opposite, that of David Cameron and George Osborne sneering back at him with their hollow congratulations. The questions that Jeremy Corbyn asked that day were these. He said he'd had two and a half thousand questions about housing. Marie had asked him what the government intended to do about the chronic lack of affordable housing, the extortionate rents. He had another question from Stephen who worked at a housing association and he said that the cuts in the rents meant that his company was losing 150 jobs and that with the loss of funding the housing association wouldn't be able to carry out its repairs on its housing stock down the line, which would mean worse conditions and worse maintenance, fewer people working there, and a greater problem for the people living in those properties. And Jeremy Corbyn asked David Cameron, don't you think it's about time that something was done? Cameron replied with his usual platitudes, and a mantra that's been familiar to us through this campaign. And he said that, of course, you have to have a strong economy, a magic money tree to do all of these things, a magic money tree. And we keep hearing them saying that, and we must live with them in, in our means. He went on and asked a question from Claire. And Claire asked about tax credits, how changes to the tax credit thresholds were going to supposed to help hard-working people. She said, I work part-time, my husband works full-time earning £25,000 a year. They had five children. The decrease in tax credits will see our income plummet. And Jeremy Corbyn asked Cameron, how is this fair? And yet again he came back and said, the country has to live within its means. We were left an unaffordable welfare system, a system where work didn't pay, and then made claims to record employment, and so forth. Jeremy Corbyn went on to say that he'd had a thousand emails on mental health. Jeremy Corbyn went on to say he'd had a thousand emails on mental health. Gail asked, do you think it's acceptable that the mental health services in this country are on their knees at the present time? David Cameron agreed, but of course stressed that we have to have a strong economy because we can't have a strong NHS without a strong economy. Talking about the Labour Party going on to go down the route of unlimited spending, unlimited borrowing, unlimited taxes, printing money that will wreck the economic security of our country. Jeremy Corbyn went on and asked a question from Angela, who was a mental health professional. She said that beds were unobtainable, even in serious mental health crises and people that needed desperate help were left, or are left, with inadequate care, um, or, or they may be admitted many miles from their family and support systems. The, sim the situation is simply unacceptable. Again, on this question, the mantra came back, the magic money tree mantra. And then at the end of the last question, with all the smug faces faded slightly, there was a question from Andrew Turner, the Isle of Wight MP Conservative, who asked a question about importing a tiger that had been badly treated in a circus. 
and were stranded in Belgium. Well, the Tories and the neoliberal governments that have gone before them, including the new Labour blue Tory Blair governments and Brown. Jeremy Corbyn is a human hand grenade that's been handed to the people, the many, not the few. And it's a hand grenade that they can legally throw into the system that has stolen their lives, their security. And on June the 8th, on election day, although they've lost their jobs or they're languishing on zero hours contracts and the insecurities with ever worse conditions through the weakening of employment protections. So the house has been foreclosed and the bank has come and the divorce is going through. Wives and family separated, cars repossessed not had a real holiday for years, stuck on shitty zero-hour contracts, can't get a living wage for £7 an hour. They've lost everything. Everything but one thing. And that thing doesn't cost a penny. It's guaranteed to them by the British Constitution, and that's the right to vote. They might be penniless, they might be homeless, they might have been fucked over, fucked up, but it doesn't matter. Because on June the 8th, things are equalised. Where they have the same vote as a millionaire. It's one person, one vote, not one pound, one vote. So the many have nots can take on the millionaire class. On June the 8th, the dispossessed, the downtrodden, the barely managing, the struggling, or the just plain disgusted at the lack of empathy and understanding shown by the political class. They can walk into that booth, they can pull across the curtain, and they can take their pen, and they can put a great big fucking cross in the box by their Labour candidate, by the candidate that's in the party that has been led by the man who threatens to upend and overturn the very system that's ruined their lives. That man's Jeremy Corbyn. They see that the elites hate Jeremy Corbyn, they see that the City of London hates Jeremy Corbyn, that the career politicians hate Jeremy Corbyn, they see that all their chocka mocha latte neoliberal friends in the city and the establishment, in the technocracy, and they see that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, their friend Jeremy Corbyn. So on June the 8th, Angela, Gail, Claire, Paul, Steve and Marie, Uncle Tom, Cobbley and all can blow out the blowhards, the U-turn queens, the smug look down their noses at you blowhards and yes they can blow up the whole fucking system because it's your right. The election of Corbyn is going to be the biggest fuck you ever recorded in human history. And it's going to feel bloody good.